afternoon. Uh, no, it's getting to be a longish day. I apologise, by the way, if my voice goes. It's my third day of conferences this week, so I'm starting to come down with conference flu. <laughs> right, so if we just kick off. First of all, the classic thank you to the sponsors. I say organising a conference this week myself. These people have paid for lunch, the venue, and all the videos you're going to be able to watch later on. So please go and at least say hello and see what they've got. You'll be surprised what they can offer you. So four great sponsors. Um, let's go and check to those. This is me. This is the afternoon for DBA to do PowerShell. We had Andre in here before, and that's where I came through as well. I'm predominantly SQL Server DBA, but I throw data around all sorts of platforms and databases. Um, Organised SQL Relay, now Data Relay, two user groups, and an MVP data platform. So, today, this afternoon's agenda, four quick bits on there. What is ChatOps, and why is it of interest to us? How can we do that with PowerShell? A load of demos, which is the fun bit, and then the questions afterwards, which may extend if the demos don't work. Fingers crossed, I've run through them a number of times this afternoon. So they should be fine. But there's always the chance that I've annoyed someone in the last 30 seconds and they'll stop working. So chat, what's chat? Well, chat is any system. You've all seen chat things. Facebook and WhatsApp are chats. You can chat one-on-one -on -one or you can chat to a group. It's just a way of messages going back and forth in semi-real time. So Slack's the classic trendy one at the moment. Teams is Microsoft's heavyweight version. It's getting more and more enterprise uh, ingrained. Twitter, Facebook Messenger, IRC, then you've got HipChat, Campfire. What's Jira's, what's uh, Malaysian's one called? Is that HipChat these days? So there's been a lot of mergers, and I stick with Slack and Teams, because that's what we use at work. Um, but there's a whole host of these. And these are all systems that people have um, implemented chat ops on. All it is is a way of talking to a system that passes messages back and forwards. So IRC is actually still used a lot because you can run that internally, securely in your own server, and it's a really tiny footprint. Um, so that's living on quite happily. Um, and why is chat a good thing? So over email or face-to-face -face communications, it's easy to split your topics out into channels. So you can have a general topic where you can chat about what you had for lunch and what's going on. You can have another one discuss Project A, another one for Project B. It's easy to spin up new channels. So with our system, we'll spin up a new channel for deployment. So all the chat related to deployment for that morning will go in one channel. Makes it easy to find. And also, it's easy then to archive that channel when we're finished. We also use them for incidents. So we have a major outage. We swap a new channel. We can all chat in it, say, oh, have you tried doing this? Yes, I've tried doing that. Oh, I've done this while we fix it. And then we can archive it for review after we've fixed everything. Um, if you want to bring new people in, those channels contain all the history. How many people here have been CC'd into an email halfway through a project, and you've not seen the first 30 emails that explain why you're in the mess you're at now? With chat, it doesn't matter. If you join the channel, yes, it's going to be dull reading the last three weeks worth of messages, but you can scroll through and get the gist of what people have been talking about. You can grant people read-only access, again, when you're trying to triage an incident in email, do you get a boss chiming in saying, oh, have you tried this? It's like, no, no, we've moved on from DOS now. You know, last time they touched a keyboard was when their secretary spilled something on it. Um, you can give them read-only access so they can see what you're doing, but they can't interfere with what you're doing. It's easy to snooze, hide, or ignore. So obviously, you know, people come up and talk to you, your phone rings, they sort of know you're there, you can't hide it. This, you can just turn off notifications. So I've turned off all the notifications on all my Slack channels other than the one for the demos this afternoon. <laughs> so I can ignore those quite happily. Um, Cross-communication, it's easy to chat across people. And you can pull people into other groups as and when needed. And it beats phone calls where you can't get information across properly. You ever try to look at a code sample over a telephone? Or if someone's trying to describe a piece of code to you or a processor graph, it doesn't work. And email, mine's just full of spam. I don't really care whose turn it is to buy the tea bag this month. It's like, I just want to see the stuff I need. So, why do we have chat ops? What well, follows on from the thing of DevOps, and this is personal opinion, by the way. This is not a formal definition. I've always been 
taught to think of this DevOps thing we do as speeding up your feedback loops. The idea is you do a small piece of work, you test it, you know within a minute has it worked, has it failed. Same when you deploy something. You deploy it, you test it, it's failed, roll it back and do it. So with um, something like this, with chat or email, if you're in an email and you want to respond to someone's information, you've got to go and find that information. So say someone says, oh, we think box one is under a lot of CPU load. And you want to send the CPU graph, you have to trundle off, open up the Nagios system, find the box, right click, copy and paste into the email and send it back. Much easier if you've got some way you could just so say, show me the CPU for box X, and it will do the work for you and bring it back into the system. Yeah? And that's really where the chat up stuff comes from, is to speed up our interactions as well. So when Fred asks you a question about a system, you don't have to go and fire up another window into another system and then work out how you're going to get the data out. You just have a simple command and send it back. Or even better, he can run the command and get the information himself. So you're not involved. You just push it off to someone else to do it themselves. Self-service is great. Um, so these chat up integrations, there's three main types that we'll look at. Script integrations. So these are just simple hooks. We've all got scripts that run overnight, and we want to know whether they've passed or failed. Um, so you can just have it send the information to the Slack channel rather than drop it into your reporting tool or your email. So that's fairly simple, but it keeps them all together. And you can put them into specific channels for different people to monitor and have a look at. App integration. This is a very common one. This is where you have third-party apps that report in. So the classic ones are having something like GitHub hooked up into your Slack channel. So every time someone opens a PR or an issue, you get a notification of what's going on. So you can go back and review them. And then the really interesting one, and where we're really going to do the meat of this afternoon session, is bot integration. This is where you have something you can ask to do some work or you can interact with. Yep. And this is something you can extend and add more function depending on your needs. Whereas the other two are a little bit static depending on what you've got. You might be able to filter, I don't know, this gets a bot, I need to look at this repository in my setup. But other than that, you'd have to write something yourself. So if you wanted to do something really complex with the internal Git repository, you'd be looking at doing a bot. Yeah? So PowerShell has two very useful modules for interacting um, with chat ops. So PS Slack is a simple integration script integration tool. It just lets you send a message back to Slack so you can embed that in your scripts. The more advanced one is PoshBot, and this is a chat ops bot implemented purely in PowerShell. So as we all do PowerShell, that's probably the best one to look at. There are others. You've got things like Hubot, which is the granddaddy of them all. GitHub wrote that for their internal processes many years ago. Um, that's written in CoffeeScript, which I expect not many of us actually read, talk, or understand. So not much point in looking at that. Um, it's built around classes, so it has to be PowerShell greater than 5 to run it. Um, it will run on PowerShell Core. It supports Slack and Teams. Now, I'm not demoing Teams this afternoon, because one, Teams, you have to run it on um, PowerShell Core. And He's fixed that in the latest release of PowerShell 5 as well now. Is it? Ah, oh, thank you. But the main reason is, the way that Teams processes messages is awkward. With Slack, you just have webhooks like a lot of other applications. So you set something up to monitor your Slack channel, and it can just see all the messages going past, and it can act on those messages. Teams does it the other way around. It sends the messages, and it wants a permanently listening endpoint to send them to. So obviously, yes, if you're writing something that sits in um, a public cloud, that's fine. You can have that. Now, if you're using to run on-premise processes, you really don't want to be opening up web port through your firewall. So to set that up, you have to set up an Azure function, which is your permanent endpoint, which gets the messages from Teams, and then you write the JSON from that into an Azure service bus queue. And then PoshBot polls the service bus queue. It works, but there's a lot of mucking around to get Teams hooked up. Um, Teams is a very heavyweight solution. Yes? Sorry, what was that? So the question was, are there any deployment processes for setting up Teams? Yeah. What you just described. Yes, there is documentation on the Poshbot site on how to do it. Manually. Yes, manually. 
Um, it's not undoable, but if you click the wrong button, you have to undo it all. Yeah. So it, you're looking at having an hour or two to make sure you've got it right. So it's, it's improved the documentation as well. Yes. Yeah, it was horrendous and it was guessing. <laughs> yeah, I went through that one and then the new stuff's pretty good, but I always get lost at the bit in T's where you have to pick your bot type. Um, like I say, they've designed it really for really heavyweight bots in their AI, AI department, I think, rather than Slack, which just wants a cheap way of getting you to a script editor. Sorry, script interpreter. So those are the two main ones we're going to look at. And at this point, we now drop to demos. So it's a nice topic. There's not too many slides because it's the doing bit that's really interesting. So let me scroll through all the windows. Right, so the first one we're going to look at is sending information with PS Slack. Oh, let me open it in a better way. There we go. Is that readable for everyone? I did do a quick check just before I went in. I just stand here so I can see it the right way around. So, PS Slack module. It's just a standard PowerShell module, so install module, it'll pull the latest version from the gallery and you import it. Uh, this is a really simple script. All it does when you run it is it sleeps for two minutes and then it sends a message to Slack to say it's finished running. So you have a hook. So when you set up a bot on Slack, which I shall show you in a second, you will get OAuth tokens and the webhooks. And you just pull those back to push into your scripts. You then just send a Slack message. That's a really simple version. All we're doing is sending a message to the webhook, telling it to be passed, and it just has the text saying, test job just finished. That's it. It's a very simple response back. Then underneath, we send another message with a lot more information. That you can really format these to your heart's content. So in this case, it succeeded, because start sleep is not going to fail. So it sends it back with a nice green color. You could send red if it failed. A title, the text, a pretext, who sent it, what the short version, be, if anything else fails, we're sending it to the general channel, we can put an emoji on it, remember Slack is predominantly for sharing GIFs, despite what everyone says, and then we just send a Slack message. So we're just piping that all through. In fact, this is pretty much the example that's on the PS Slack page. It works, I use this pretty much in production, because it works. You just wrap it around, do your normal command, try, catch. If it fails, dump out lots of red text with the error message. If not, green and say it's wrong. If I set that running while I show you the Slack end. So I was trying not, I forgot I needed Slack open to show you how to get the webhooks. I've got an anonymous window open, so I've got a less privileged user in my channel. Um, give me a second, just log into Slack. So if you're going to add a bot, you just go to apps. And you'll initially get a list. Well, if you want to see all the other apps you can have, we're just going to have third party app integrations. 
there is a big list of them available there, um, which will do all sorts of things. So you can have integration to Google Calendar if you use that internally. So if someone creates a new meeting, sorry, a new event, it will get popped into Slack if you want. Um, we use the Dropbox one a lot, managing data relay. We've got a Dropbox account. Every time someone adds a file or updates one, we get a ping into the document management channel on our Slack so we can keep track of files. Um, and the, the usual ones, if you go down, they will, uh, you know, all the usual things like Git, Trello, Jira's in there. If you want Jenkins to report in, that's available from there as well. of things. Let me refer to my notes. Unfortunately, this sort of thing where you do once, and usually that's where you forget about it. That's why I've written myself so notes. So all you do is you go to the app, Slack Appy page. Just zoom in a bit. Create a new app. Give it the Slack workspace you want to do. Create the app, and it's done. And then the permissions. You can set things up and you will get your OAuth tokens back. Storm. Right, so let's go for the classic of here's one I made earlier. But <laughs> if you put an app in, you will then go to the OAuth tokens, you will get the webhook and the OAuth token, which you then use. Apologies for that. <laughs> so once you've got all the information, you can then build up a Poshbot config. Um, it's a fairly simple config to set up, and you really only need this the first time you build something, and this one's got a few more features than you've probably set up. Um, Poshbot, PS Gallery again, so an install module. Um, I tend to stick to exactly what the Poshbot guys say, just it makes life easier to read. So, Poshbot path, config, plugins, and logs. These are just folders you create to keep everything nicely tidied. Everything is logged. Create some parameters for the bot. You give it a name, bot admins. So that's my username in the channel. That's the underlying Slack ID for that user. Just in case there's ever a lookup or a change it. You give it a command prefix. So the bot will scan everything that goes through the channel, but it will only trigger on certain things. So traditionally, you'll have a single character that you put at the start of the command. So if you went exclamation mark, do something, the bot will then try and interpret that and do something. Um, you may want to change it if you've got more than one bot in the channel. That's perfectly acceptable to have more than one bot scanning. Just remember, lots of people will be reading the same stuff. So you want to make sure that you're not going to be treading on each other's toes, They're both trying to do the same job. Um, change the log level. Backend configuration. This section changes depending on whether you're using Slack or Teams. If you're using Teams, it's got all the information about the service bus. If you're doing Slack, you just tell it's a Slack backend. That's an internal type. And then you pass in the OAuth token that I just failed to show you how to get. Yeah? And that does all the authentication. Once that goes in, Slack knows which channel you're looking at. 
um, pass through the log directories. You can also have alternate command prefixes. So rather than actually going exclamation mark, do this, you can go, Bob, do this. Um, and the reason it's in twice is the regular expression they use to match the um, bot command is case sensitive. And if you run Slack on your phone, like me with iOS, it capitalizes the first letter. So on, on, my PC, on my Mac, it's fine. Bob lowercase works. I've got that one in to catch it on my phone. <laughs> Otherwise, you get really annoyed and you have to constantly back and forth on iOS, which is not great. So that's just the basic hash table you build up for your configuration. You tell it to actually build a new Poshbot configuration by splatting through the parameters. And then you save it. And this writes out to PSD1 file. And then you can just restart it every time. Create a new back end. Tell it where to pick up the configuration from. And then you start it. And it starts up in a verbose mode here. This is just so we can see what's going on with work, while we're working. So if we have a quick look at the folder. It's Poshbot 1. You'll see there's nothing in there apart from my cleanup script to clean up before the demo. Um, oh, those have got things in them. Sorry, that's why I didn't delete. OK, so it's a fairly empty folder. If we now I'm in the right folder, aren't I? Nope. that started it and now we also have a logs folder a config folder sorry config file groups file permissions and a psda posh config so if i now refresh this a whole host of ps sorry is it not working sorry right. sorry about that quick av issue So you can see it's written out that config we passed in to a PSD1 file. So we now, so we now actually have a config file. It's also created a groups config file, a permissions config file, um, and a logs folder that's gradually filling up with a poshbot log that tells you what it's doing. Yeah. So now if we go over to Slack, the webhook has finished and sent a message up there. So nothing major there. But now we have a listening bot. So those are all the commands it knows about at the moment. So you just use the exclamation mark, help, and it lists all the commands. Um, these are all the built-in ones. It's got a good help system. Um, you can ask for help on a topic. So if we went Bob, help. I know, let's look at the update plugin. It will go through and give you a bit more information about the command, how you can run it, maybe some examples, and any permissions that are set on it. Yep. Um, so that's out the box. It really just comes with the ones to manage Poshbot itself. So it's not going to do anything too interesting. So the next thing you think is, well, that's great. How do I add extra commands to do the interesting stuff? Well, a simple way is you install plugins. So plugins are just a PowerShell module that's been written a very slightly different way to normal. There's one little extra section in the functions. So there's a couple of demo ones on the Poshbot site, one of which is called Poshbot Networking. 
So we just install that from the gallery. Is already installed. Oh, they've updated it. Let's put the new one in. Live dangerously. I trust their code more than I do a lot of people's code. It's a fairly simple module. I can always force the old one in. There we go. That will teach me. No, it shouldn't plob rip. That's fine. So we've now installed a module. The next thing we need to do is bring it into, um, into Poshbot. At the minute, you see we don't have anything about plugins in our list. Yeah? Because it's only using the built-in commands. If we now go back here, we can ask Bob to import plugin networking. Well, I can type. Is it install plugin? Yep. I set that demo script up so I could cut and paste everything, and I forgot to do that and typed it. Yep, so it's installed a plugin and it's given us two commands dig and ping. So, dig, if you've not met it before, is a DNS lookup tool. It gets you a few information. So, we can ask Bob about dig. And there we go, we've got some examples of how to use it. So if I go dig, there you go. Right, first problem, I'm not allowed to actually run it. By default, when you bring commands in, they don't, you don't have permissions on them, even running as the admin user like I am here. If you look here, you have permissions. Within each plugin, you can define your own permissions. So common ones are read and write. So get commands are read, set commands are write. This one happens to have a permission called test network. So we need to grant ourselves permission to that. We do that with the built-in tools. So the way it works is you have a user is assigned to a group the group is given a role, and that role is then assigned the permissions on the object. So group can have more than one role. So it might be that you let your network guys have access to this networking role, but they only have read access to other modules. And conversely, your DBAs may have write access to the database module, but you don't trust them with networking. Yep. And you can build these up. You can have multiple roles as and when you go. At the minute, just to show you, we have one group, that's the admin group, of which I'm a member. And also now we have a plugins group, which tells us that we've imported a plugin. So it knows that ping and dig are calls to those options and that it's enabled. So what we do now is we start looking at how to do it. So we have new group commands and stuff that we go through. So this is just showing you, if you're not sure about something does, you can use the help and it will quickly tell you what's going on. But we can just quickly cut through. So I'm gonna create a new group called net test and give it a description so we can remember what it's called later. So we can remember what we created it for later. There you go, it's running away. We can create a new role. We're going to grant that role permissions to the networking module. And we're just going to grant this. To me now. So now. Oh. 
Why are you playing up with that? Yes. Bro, that's the one. Thank you. So if this works, it will just prove you can do these things out of order. Yeah, that's working. <laughs> there you go. So now I've got all the AAA records. The reason I don't always remember those commands is because the config is all written into the PSD folders. So once you've created the groups and the permissions, it could be quicker to just go and edit these files directly. How do you get around the security aspect of people accessing directly? We would, we don't, people wouldn't have access to this group. We would have it on a server that's only got limited, limited access. It's like any other config file you've got. You'd lock it down. You know, at some point, you have to trust Windows security. So you know, put in a box, only have admins have access to that box. Um, you know, there is no sensitive information contained as you can source control it as well. You should keep comparing it back and forth. Um, but sometimes if you're setting these up in bulk, this is a good way to do it. Or if you've got standard groups, you may just copy this onto a new bot instance if you're moving it across to another channel. Um, so some, sometimes it's a quick way of doing it. Um, like I say, I like text files. It's just nice and easy to edit them and store them. Uh, so you have to remember the commands. So that's the basic bits. What I'm going to move on to now is looking at some more advanced um, plugin development. So this is how you can take your own scripts and convert them so they run as Poshbot plugins. Yeah? So I'm just going to kill this instance because I've got one that's pre-configured. How am I doing here? Plenty of time. A question. Yes, go for it. Yes, correct. This is what I'm going to do on my new instance. So the question was, if you've got those config files, do you need to configure it next time you start it? No, because now they're started, you can just read those at startup. So that's what's going to happen. It's going to a different folder. So in this folder, I've already got all the files configured, all the plugins in. And I have a PSD posh start. And all that does is imports the module, tells it where to go and look for the config, and starts it. So it persists between instances. Yeah? And if you're running this in production, you would probably run this as a service. You know, just wrap it and call it on a service. It restarts if it fails. And you can manage it like any other Windows service. So again, like I say, this is quite quick. I basically created um, this instance to do most of the testing, copied it into that other folder, deleted all the files, and you know, I could test quickly and duplicate it. So I should just check it's running. And this one's called how, just so I don't get confused between which instance I'm in. It says, oh, do I change that? Did I start it? No, I didn't, sorry. Okay. So status just tells you how long it's been up for and how much it's been used. So has everyone here written a PowerShell module? Or at least seen enough demos at conferences that you know the bits and pieces? Yeah? Excellent. Um, so you know that there's two parts to a module definition. That you've got the, um, sorry, not the plugins. You've got the PSD one 
that defines the basics of the module. That's where you have your versioning number, your GUID and everything. So who wrote it and all the bits and pieces required modules. Um, and your permissions. Here you can define what the permissions are for this module. So in this example, I've got read, write, and dev. So read would be, you know, you give everyone access to stuff that just gets information. Yeah, assuming it's not sensitive information. Write means they can make changes. And in this example, the dev is allowing a developer specific access to one function that lets them write data in a very constrained manner. And you can go to town with this. We've got a permission at work called spend which lets you spin up Azure stuff. So basically that's allowed to people who can be trusted to remove it after they've spun it up. Yeah. So you can go as far as a deep in this. A lot of modules, people keep them quite small and you just have read and write. Because the read and write in this module is not the same as the read and write in another module. You explicitly grant it for in that module. So if you've got read, for instance, in the database module, you don't, so if you've got write in the database module, you won't get write in the networking module. They have separate to the modules. So it depends on how much you do. You, know, you can just write very small modules and split them that way, or you could have lots of permissions within a module. Yeah. So that's really the only difference in the um, PSD1 that you'll see over a normal module. And again, the PSM module is pretty much the same. It's just a list of functions that it just exports at the end as module members. Yeah? So nothing too fancy there. So one of the big things these days is if you talk to a lot of services at work, you've got API calls. So we use Nagios for monitoring at work. So Nagios is a reasonably good API framework. And if you use Nagios XI, you get a few more as well. So if we want to ask Nagios a question, we just throw out a web request and it comes back. However, spinning up a lot of those services is quite tricky. So I've cheated and I'm using things like Pugbomb. So if you've not met this before, it's basically a service that returns random photos of Pugs, the dog, doing something silly. But it's, this is exactly what you could do with any other service. So I've written a fun PowerShell function. So your standard PowerShell definition, function, get Pug. Just ignore that bit for a second. The usual things, it's an advanced function. It takes no parameters. Web request, JSON result, and it returns the URL to a picture of a pug. Yeah. The important bit for Poshbot is this part. It has its own little header section. So you give it a command name. So this is the default name that um, Poshbot will look at it. You give it some aliases. Pug bomb, pug me whatever you wanted to go in there, um, and then the permissions it's got. And these are, again, you could say read and dev, so just create an array in that case rather than have a single string. It runs it, and you just have a posh bot card response which sends back the URL. The ordering of these three is really important. When it imports the module, it uses um, AST to split it up. And if you get these in the wrong order, you will start not seeing aliases. Because the way it passes, it looks for them in order. I ran into that early on and wondered why I couldn't see aliases um, or commands wouldn't appear. And just to show you, the help system will scan through all the command headers, so all your help text, to look for a word. So I've just typed help pug, and it's gone through and found it because it's got the word pug in it. Um, one of the just while I'm doing this, one of the demos later involves a company called Acme and doing some work for them. So if I just search for Acme, it lists the commands that are about the Acme company. So it's quite easy for end users to find stuff in here if you push it out to them. And if I just um, pug me, in the background, my Azure box has just run off to this little third-party API. You can get a URL back, and hopefully we'll get a picture of a pug doing something. There we go. <laughs> so really, really pointless example, but if you think, if you've got a service that can return you a CPU graph, 
So we can query Nagios and say, give me server X for the last 60 minutes. And we can see things going up. So we use Sentry1 a lot at work. That's got an API you can query as well. So I can go show me the um, buffer pool for the last 60 minutes. So you can pull it back. So if someone says, is the box working well? I they can type the command. Picture straight back there. Or if I'm fault finding something, I can pull it back. Someone else goes, oh, actually, I saw you do that yesterday. We've not had to break out of our window to go and find anything. And because it's searchable, people might scroll back up and say, actually, someone's been looking at that CPU graph every day. Have we got a recurring problem? Is it spiking? Yeah? So it's just about how you can pull stuff into here from multiple sources. Um, so the next one's more of the same, but it's just slightly more useful. Has anyone met Mockaroo? It's an online service that returns mock data for testing. Um, you can create schemas. So this particular one gets me a thousand rows of first name, last name, UK city, date of birth, and IP address as a CSV. So it's great. I can have random data for testing imports into databases. Again, this is the sort of thing where I can make it easy for someone to grab data matching our defined schema. So that's, again, they don't have to go to another tool. We don't, they don't even have to have PowerShell. They can just run it from wherever they are. Get onto a phone one later. Just notice I'm running a bit of time. Um, get who am I? All this does is works out who's running the, running the actual command. I changed the aliases from what we used to at work. This will just show you which user is actually running the service. This is something to bear in mind. This is actually running as the admin on the box. So in production, you wouldn't do this, but it just gets around it because it's constrained as your endpoint. So we're fine. Um, this is a good case for using something like Jira. Run a powerful account, have it talk to an endpoint. You've got two layers of security. You've got the fact that users can only run the commands you've exposed in Slack. And the calling account at the bottom can only call the functions you've enabled through the JIRA endpoint. Have people met JIRA endpoints? Yeah, various nods. I talked about JIRA endpoints for an hour last year at PS Day. <laughs> so if you search PS Day, JIRA, YouTube, you will find the video from last year. Go and have a look. It's quite a handy security technique if you need to elevate privileges but don't want to give people domain admin access. You can hide commands from them. that. So the example I had for Acme is we have a lot of third party um, support contracts. And we don't want them having permanent access to the servers. The idea is if our customers phone through a support call to them, they raise a ticket with us, we enable the account for a set period of time. And these jobs always get lost in our queue because we're busy doing bigger things. So we wanted a nice way for our help desk guys to be able to modify the logon users of a, another account. So basically, we wrote a little function called enable support account that just talks to AD, sets the specified account, so it's fixed to one account. They can't do this for any other account they want to, just the one account. And it just sets them to be able to log on 8 to 4, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. today. If you're not log on hours, it's a 21, um, the array term. Sorry, it's a 21 bit, 21 value bit array for three, eight hours per day. So we just set today's to that. So we've also created them a test the support account to see if it's enabled. And we have a disabled support account so they can disable it if they want to. What we have is we have a, um, a scheduled task that runs every day at 5 p.m. that disables all the support accounts, just because we don't want them on the boxes if we're not there or we haven't agreed for them to stay in. It just locks them off at the VPN, so we're, we're good, they're out. I can go home without worrying that they're going to break something overnight. So if I... 
So if someone gets a support call that says, we need to enable Acme to come on a support, they can quickly ask how help me with Acme, and it gives them the three commands. Because we've used fairly standard um, naming conventions, it's fairly obvious, disable, enable, and test. And we've got some shortened aliases so I can type less. My original background is Unix, so I'm used to commands like grep, and or and said, so I like three character abbreviations. Um, so that one just go off and test the account. There you go, so it's currently not open. So I might just go E8. That one off and enable it. Um, so it tells me it's open until when, and then if I test it, it will be open. Um, I can go into ID and prove it, but trust me, it's working. <laughs> so this sort of, again, would be a case where you could have a um, organizational-wide Slack channel, and you could grant your help desk guys access to these commands, and they can just toggle stuff on and off, or even to your um, application support team. So you know, if they know they've got a problem with their, with their um, service, they can let people into it. Because it's just a PowerShell function, one thing we did with one user group, we were opening it every day, we put another parameter on the end where they had to put in the ticket number. So there had to be an open, so we did a check in Zendesk, which we use for ticketing. So if there wasn't a Zendesk ticket with that name, because we could do a web request to check, it denied it and told them to go away. They were just proactive, pre pre you know, doing it first thing in the morning, so it was open for the rest of the day, so they didn't have to worry about it. It's like, no, you've got to put a ticket number in. Because really, if you're opening that often, there's a problem we want to know about it. So because it's PowerShell behind, you can start doing those things under the hood. You're not giving users free reign. You're giving them a very constrained access to certain bits and pieces in an easy, manageable way. So again, the great thing is, if I'm out and about from the office, do this demo now. Sorry, half my life is on Slack, so I'm just trying to find the right one. If I see someone's enabled an account and I don't want it to be enabled, while I'm in a meeting, I've just disabled it remotely. And obviously this builds up. If there's enough time, I've got a demo where I did that with restoring a database. I did it the other week on the tram on the way home from work, just restored a database for my phone. Yeah? So that's just disabled it. If I spot something strange going on, I can work remotely. I don't need to have a full setup with me. Yeah? Yes, that's the final, that's the final thing. And it's, um, so, and it's one of these things that just because you can, don't. So I've imported the DBA tool. This is the other reason why I wasn't going to do Teams today. So until Chris told me, I didn't know it ran on PowerShell 5, and we can't do PS Core yet with um, DBA tools because .NET Core doesn't support SMO. There is an open ticket. Please go and vote it up. Yeah? We'd love to have it out there. We want to support it. We just can't until Microsoft ports SMO to, to um, .NET Core. So this just restores the last backup. It takes you a SQL Server instance, database name, gets the last full backup and restores it over the top to replace it. So it's, you know, someone's dropped the devs have dropped the table they were testing, you just restore it to last night's backup. Yeah, so that's a write permission. And then we have a restore last dev backup, which is exactly the same query, except I'm not letting it take parameters, I'm fixing them. Yeah, and I've given that the dev permissions. And right, so I can call it as well as the devs. Yeah, it saves me adding to me to the dev group. Now, both of these are great, but the best thing about the bottom one is you can't mistype it. This is the way, just because you can, I could expose, you know, programmatically, I just query the comment based help and expose every parameter for restore DBA database through Slack. Because you don't have type ahead and you possibly do it on your phone in a hurry, I'm probably the only person whose Swift key has all the restore DBA database parameters memorized from doing all the Slack help and the um, GitHub help, you're never going to type it on the bus or the train or in a meeting in a hurry. So if you've got core database you want to do, wrap them up in their own little service. Yeah? Because obviously, you know, that's the example to do it from the Slack command line. Or I can just type how RLDB. Uh, that, sorry, I think that's just, that's just the type of thing that it can do in, 
it doesn't really matter. That's just a posh way of doing it. An example from somewhere and change things, it doesn't make much difference. Um, I think it's just the way they pass the strings. I've got a feeling that was an old demo I've copied and pasted. Well, an old internal command that I've copied and pasted across. Um, so you've got all those sort of bits and pieces. You can run scripts, export data, import data. Five minutes, that's good. Like I say, I can now, just for the final position. Okay. So that will sit and run. One thing you might be thinking is this will take multiple commands. So I've got a command called wait that just does a start sleep in the background. So if I ask how to wait for 60 seconds, and then how wait 30 seconds, I can then see what's sitting in the background. Oh, I put a dot in before the RLDB, so that's not actually running. Again, that's the thing with the phone. You've got to actually stare at it properly. There we go, that will run now. But you can queue up commands. This can be doing lots of things for different people. And you can... Um, Wrong way around. Are you going to listen to me? Oh, sorry, I'm doing direct to Slapbox, sorry. Sorry, that was actually talking to Slack's own bot. Is that? Yeah. So I can take it off and talk to it in DM. So if I want to ask a question and not look an idiot when I'm typing, I want to try a command, I can do it in there. It doesn't work when I'm streaming it onto a screen here, but you can talk to it. So if you just want to get some information, you, don't want, you know, you're doing some work, you don't want to spam the channel, you can do it in here. And if we go back to the main channel now, you'll see it's run them all and waited in the option. And I didn't get the how command status, but if you're running multiple commands, it will tell you which ones you've got and how long they've been running. Just do that again. So it'll tell me how many commands I've got in the background, how long they've been running. And then the other two will complete as they go. So the 30 second one will finish first and the 60 second one will still complete. They're spun off a separate process in the background. So you don't have to worry about running a long running job it will keep going. There are some timeouts where it will look and think you've been running this command for an hour. So if you're running a big database restore, you may just want to check it will actually complete and you can upload those values. So, are there any questions? Yes. Um, I expect you could certainly write something that does it. You probably have to write a. F uh, you have to do it yourself, something like that. Yes. I've not seen. I think there's support for sending back cards with buttons on. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, you, you can get, yeah, sorry, you can get buttons back, but that would be more of a case of you give it an instance name. You'd have to put something in your function to say that doesn't exist and fire it back saying, are you sure about that? Yes, no. So I don't think you can have it, you know, restore database, it will come back and say, which instance? This one. Or which database? This one. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yes, no, yes, you can do that. And you can even, you can even do it by who, who's calling it. There is a, sorry, another way. But this is just going to call all the variables that are available to the Poshbot instance. You do get a um, information about who's calling it. So as well as having the permission, you could say, oh, actually, that's our junior DBA. Should we just check he actually wants to do this? Yeah. You know, or if someone wants to restore a big database during production hours, you might have a, are you really, really sure you want to be doing this? But if they do it at nine at night, you know they're trying to restore it for something else. Yeah? Thank you. Yes. Any more questions? Yes. What's the most elaborate, crazy thing you've done? Uh, 
Restore database is a big thing. We've got some big application restart scripts in there. So for instance, we've got a Cognos infrastructure at work that's a pig to restart everything in the right order because it's multiple boxes, Oracle web logic, and all display layers. So we've got that scripted. Um, so you can restart Cognos, and it will just go through and do everything in order for you and report back as it's restarted the boxes in order. Um, we've got the same for various bits of web infrastructure that let us do stuff in and out. Um, but th those are the sort of big things we've got. Um, but again, it's the sort of we used a lot for offloading work. So for some of our web infrastructure, we have a test web infrastructure call. So once that's been called, it sets a flag. So if it failed, our help desk can then restart it. You know, it runs a test against, um, I work for university. So we've got some stuff where students can top up their smart cards with money to pay for printing. And it's a third party app and it's known to fall over. They can run a test, it runs our scripts and says, you know, oh, right, these three web servers have died and they can just restart those. Or it'll say DB is down and they can restart the database but they have to have run the test script first and the test script would have written something locally as a config variable saying it's been tested and it's the database. So then they just run restart and off it goes. And that's what they've got. They've got very limited access, but it means that at three in the morning on deadline day, I don't get a phone call saying students can't top up their printing, which used to happen. It's just like, you know. And we've given them ability, people the ability to look up their, their people's accounts. So now um, we've got a big IDM infrastructure because we have lots of users with lots of different permissions. So they can now drill down into AD and the various systems to check exactly what's enabled in every system. So all they do is you know, check Fred. And it goes through all Fred's permissions, all the systems, and returns them. So it's nice and quick and easy for them. And then if they need us to do any work, they can just send us the output, we look for the red bit, and we know what to fix and where. So you know, it's just PowerShell. If you've got a huge PowerShell script, you can port it into there really is just that posh bot section you need to put in the top. Yeah. So, you know, that would be an easy way. We could just put that in every D DBA tools function and it would be posh bot ready. But you'd probably just blow your system with a typo in the first 30 seconds. <laughs> um, and that's one of the other bad things. You can't, obviously, when you're in the Slack bit, you can't pipe. So you have to build all that into your back script. You sort of get what you're given. So, you know, it's not perfect. We're starting to move more towards it at work because we've got a big Office 365 subscription, so people would rather do that. Special, um, Slack is free for, you can get quite a lot out of the free Slack channel. I don't know if you've seen the um, SQL Collaborative one where we do all the DBA tool stuff, but it's a huge number of channels and it's on the free um, subscription. And it's amazing the amount of information you can keep in there. So if you're just testing out work, it's free, it's easy, it's cheap, but because we're bringing across so many users, they want us to move to 365, so we're not paying, as it works. We're only paying for that. Um, it works fine, and potentially, as Microsoft move it towards more of their enterprise messaging system de jour, you're going to get forced to use it anyway. Yeah. I'd rather use that than Skype IM. Is that a question or timeout? Yeah, well, no, it's a question, <laughs> but yeah, it's a minute. Yeah. Um, is the TD integration slower than Slack? Yeah. It's got to go to the service bus and it's holding the service bus. It is a little bit slower. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and it, a lot. The thing is, well, it depends on how you want to set a service bus. Depend if you on the basic layer. If you're not used it, you're waiting for it to spin up the infrastructure. We use um, the service bus a lot at internally, so we've got um, premium namespaces. So I've just stuck the Teams queue on there, so it's on dedicated Azure infrastructure, as it were, with multiple pipelines. So I've not got that spin up, spin down, because the business are keeping it alive for me. If you're on the basic one and you've not used it, you've got to wait for it to spin up. Yeah, that's you, yeah. That, there's lots of bits on the on the basic one you don't get. So it's however you want to use it. Um, the good thing is, obviously, with the Slack model, if your bot's down, you lose everything people have been trying to do in the channel. With the Teams version of the service bus, once you brought the bot back up, it will just keep holding what's in the bottom of the service bus and keep going. Obviously, a lot of the stuff you do in Slack, you're probably not bothered about it 10 minutes later. But if you are, at least it's sat there. If you've got a lot of stuff reporting in, 
it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then suddenly when it comes back up, your box is spinning like a yo-yo, yeah. So, you, so, you know, it swings in roundabouts. Which, like I say, Microsoft, I think, have designed theirs for much more um, the proper AI-type bots that are sitting in Azure and are publicly accessible. That's oh, we're trying, trying to join them across domains. Even Microsoft can't get that working. Because we've got an Azure AD at work. They tried to invite me into theirs for the MVP calls. And it took weeks to get that sorted properly, so I don't have to log in four times. The one nice feature I saw in last week's call is it now blurs the background. So if you see in front of a lot of Kanban boards, people can't read them when you're on a call. And you turn around and it's like, and you disappear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Actually, if they could start blurring about there, it'd be great. But I just don't turn my webcam on most of the time. Yeah. Any more questions or anything? Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, if you think of anything else, Twitter or whatever, and I'll answer them. And the video will be online if we'll go through it again. But the documentation for Poshbot, they have had a good rewrite of the team stuff. And there is the book that's about a third completed now. I think it's on Lean Pub, so I think it was about 30% when I last looked. But that's got all the details in it. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you.